appreciate you taking your time out of your schedule to join us today as we discuss another portion of God's Word with you. You know, baptism is one of the most hotly debated topics in religion, especially in the Christian religion. Most religious groups, or at least most Christian groups, practice some form of baptism, but most often it is separated from salvation. In other words, you're saved before you're ever baptized. You're saved at one point, and then at some point later you will be baptized. It is said that baptism is a sign of an inward grace that has already been performed on a person's heart. In other words, God has already saved you. God has already operated on your heart and cleansed your heart. And now baptism is just simply a sign to prove that that has already occurred. One of the verses that's used to support this position is found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Notice for just a moment as I read those verses, and then we'll go back and discuss them for just a moment. Beginning in verse 11 of chapter 2, we find, In him you were also circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now notice what is said in these verses. We find God working in baptism. Now the argument is sometimes made that baptism is compared to the Old Testament right of circumcision. Now circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign of the covenant God had made with Israel. And so the argument is made then, well, since baptism is like circumcision and it is compared to circumcision, then since circumcision was a sign, then baptism must also be a sign. Just as circumcision was a sign of the covenant made with Israel, So baptism today, then, is a sign of the new life that a person has in Christ. But let us look at these verses a little bit closer for a few moments. And I think when you see that, you'll find that that's not at all what these verses is trying to say. First of all, I want to point out that baptism is not compared to circumcision. That is usually the argument is made in the comparison, but that's a misunderstanding of these verses. Baptism is not compared to circumcision, but rather the comparison is between the fleshly circumcision of the Old Testament and the spiritual circumcision, which occurs at baptism. In other words, the comparison is made between a circumcision made with hands compared to a circumcision made without hands. Now, obviously, the circumcision made with hands is the circ- referring to the circumcision of the Old Testament. The circumcision made without hands is the spiritual circumcision where our sins are cut away from our fleshly body. And, of course, that can only be done by God himself. You see, frequently the Jews depended upon the physical action of circumcision as the basis of their salvation. In other words, oftentimes they would, if you would ask them, why are you going to be saved? They would say, because we have been circumcised. To them, their circumcision was a sign of their salvation, which was assured to them. But that was never intended to provide salvation. It was only a sign of the covenant God had made with his people. But if the people did not keep that covenant, then of course God was not going to save them. God was not going to save them simply because they had been circumcised. But that was the misunderstanding that they often had. You see, God, even in the Old Testament, wanted a heart circumcision, or that is, a change of life. Notice in Deuteronomy 10, in verse 16, there we find Moses writing, he said, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Uh, 
and be stiff-necked no longer. The similar command is found in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4. Now notice what Moses says. Moses is commanding the people to be circumcised in heart and not to be stiff-necked or stubborn. Now, unfortunately, they did not really listen to that, and they were pretty much stiff-necked and stubborn all their time. But nevertheless, God wanted a heart circumcision even back in the Old Testament. Today, of course, Christ's circumcision is spiritual in nature. That is, made without hands. It is a heart circumcision, a removing of the sins of the flesh, and it is wholly a work of God. This spiritual circumcision occurs at baptism. This should lead the Christian to see the superiority of his circumcision over that of the Jews. In fleshly circumcision, a small part of the physical flesh was cut off, in, but our fleshly passions and practices are removed in baptism. You see, the fleshly circumcision had nothing to do with a person's heart. That's why Moses kept commanding them to be circumcised in heart. But today, when we're circumcised in heart, then our fleshly practices, our fleshly passions, they are removed. And that is a death that takes place in baptism. Secondly, we find that Paul says three things happen to us in baptism. One, we are first buried with Christ. Now, obviously, this implies a death to sin, since you only bury something that is dead. So we die to sin, and our body of sin is then buried in baptism. Secondly, we are then raised with Christ. And thirdly, we are also made alive with Christ. You see, God forgives us all our sins on the basis of our faith in God. Notice Ephesians 2 verse 8 said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Notice this is not just faith in the power of God or faith in Christ's resurrection, but faith in what God has promised to do for us as demonstrated by raising Jesus from the dead. The power, of course, is God. The same power that raised Jesus from from the dead. And when did this raising take place? Paul said it was in baptism. In baptism, we die with Christ and we're also made alive. Now, obviously, God is not going to make you alive again until your sins are forgiven. But if our sins are forgiven, then we're already alive. So if our sins are forgiven before baptism, then we're made alive before baptism. But here Paul says that in baptism, we die to sin, we're raised with Christ, and we are made alive with Christ. You see, baptism, though, is not the means of the change, but only the time when God works to change us. Now, don't mistake me now. I'm not saying at all that baptism is the power of the change. Certainly not. God is the power. These verses make it very clear that God is the power. But when does God choose to work his power? And that is in baptism. That makes baptism important. That makes it necessary to salvation. Because until we're baptized, God has not worked in our lives to remove our sins. Now notice the third thing that happens. Notice what happens when we try to make baptism only a symbol with no actual connection to our salvation. Now remember, that is the common argument. Baptism is only a symbol. It's a sign of the circumcision that's already taken place in our hearts. But in these verses, Colossians chapter 2, These verses clearly declare that in baptism, God is working in us to make us a new creature. Paul said that in baptism, we have faith in the working of God. Now, this is present tense. 
No, we have faith in the present working of God. Not faith in what he had already done for us, but faith in what he has promised to do for us right then. When we make baptism on the assemble, however, God is not working because God has already worked. You see, according to the theory that salvation is gained before baptism, then God's work had already been done. And in baptism, the only one doing anything is man. There's nothing left for God to do because he's already forgiven us of our sins. His work is done as far as salvation is concerned. So therefore, in baptism, man is the only one doing anything. God becomes a mere spectator. He's watching what we are doing. But that's contrary to the teaching of Paul. Because Paul is saying that in baptism, we have faith in the working of God. In other words, we have faith in what God is doing. Paul clearly decides that God is working in baptism, not man. But when we make baptism no connection to salvation, then baptism becomes only an empty ritual that accomplishes absolutely nothing. But baptism is not an empty ritual. Spiritual circumcision, which according to Paul occurs in baptism, is not like this. It's like the Old Testament circumcision. Remember, spiritual circumcision is not baptism, or rather occurs in baptism, but baptism itself is not the spiritual circumcision. Baptism describes only the time when God does the circumcision. Thus, baptism does not save in itself. And certainly, we do not save ourselves in baptism. God is still the saving power. Faith is still the basis of our salvation. But the question is, when does God choose to work on our hearts? And that is in baptism. That's what Paul declares God is doing. In baptism, God works on our hearts, takes away our sins, circumcises our flesh, and takes away the body of sin, forgives us of our sins. All that is done by the power of God. And it's done in baptism. Don't relegate God to being a mere spectator in the most important action that we can ever do, and that is baptism. You see, God is not a spectator. In baptism, God is doing the work. We're simply being passive. Notice one other thing, that in baptism in the New Testament, it is never said that I baptize myself, or we should be, or we should baptize someone, but rather it's always in the passive sense, be baptized. It is something done to you, not something that you do. So again, that implies again that baptism is not a work of man as man sometimes tries to say it is. No, baptism is not a work of man. It is something that is done to us. It is also, something spiritually speaking, it is something done to us because God circumcises our hearts. I hope that if you've never been baptized, that you would do so. Take away the sins of the flesh. If you have a misunderstanding of what baptism is, hopefully this has helped clear it up just a little bit. But if you do continue to have questions, please give us a call at the number that you see on the end of this lesson. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course. Kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, PO Box 15, 
Arsradi Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu For more details dial 9244204420 9244214420God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you. Joy Creative Production For video coverage and editing, audio recording and editing, promo for advertisement, graphic design. Contact 9042494996.